The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Well, we good now? Okay, good. So uh, I'm not going to do a whole bunch of this who am I crap because they just did all that. Uh, I'd also like to say I'm very sexy. Uh, so, but, you know, you didn't come to see me. Well, y'all did. But, uh, you know, everybody else came to see all this junk. So uh, high availability systems, before we actually start talking about heartbeat, we're going to talk a little bit about HA systems. And when I say HA, just understand high availability. That's a mouthful for somebody like me who's already got a mouthful. Uh, so <clears throat> what exactly is it? By definition, high availability systems are systems that can withstand a single failure uh, without suffering loss of service. Basically, they seamlessly continue on. Uh, deprecated service is okay in a lot of these sort of things. Um, and when we start talking, uh, RAID is not actually high availability, but in some ways, since most of us are probably familiar with RAID, if you're not, raise your hand. Okay, good. You all know what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, it, it's, it's helpful for illustrative purposes. Uh, and you might want to think about high availability services as a software RAID for your services. Uh, it's important when, when you think, you know, everybody brags about, you know, I've got the Linux box with two years of uptime and stuff. Uh, and there ain't a whole lot of us that can say that. When you start talking about high availability systems, you stop talking about server uptime and start talking about service uptime. You know, you're not worried if a server fails as long as you can continue to offer whatever network services you have, whether that be FTP, web, uh, database services, what have you. And there's a lot of different ways to go about this. I'm only going to really discuss one. Uh, but your goals when you're designing high availability systems, the first thing you have to do is start eliminating single points of failure. And a lot of people look at their boxes and they think, well, I've got RAID, I've got, you know, uh, redundant power supplies, things like that. And those are all great. Those are our first line of defense because those are the things that are most likely to fail. But if you actually need stuff to stay up all the time, you have to look beyond that. It doesn't do you any good to have uh, redundant power supplies plugged into the same power feed like a UPS or something. Because if that thing goes Tango Uniform, your server does too. Uh, one of the great goals of high availability, it provides a path for maintenance. Uh, let's, uh, let's say, for instance, you've got four web servers, and they're all serving the same thing, uh, but you need to perform updates on them. Your poor sysadmin, me, could either be there at 4 a.m. when nobody is on your web servers, because remember, this is, you know, you're offering content 24-7, to anyone in, let's say, the continental US. Four o'clock here is still only 1 a.m. Pacific time. If you start doing this stuff at, you know, 1 a.m. thinking nobody's gonna be on there, that's 10 p.m. Pacific, and you're pissing off a bunch of people. So what you do with high availability systems when you need to do maintenance, like, say I need to install updates to Apache or, you know, by God, the kernel. Sometimes you can just install them, do, you know, like a graceful restart, and it's no big deal. Sometimes, like say a kernel update, 
you have to reboot that box to start running that update. And during that reboot period, if you don't have high availability, high availability systems, the uh, you have a service outage. <coughs> so what you want to be able to do is when you need to have that service outage for maintenance, seamlessly, automatically fail over to a secondary system that can handle the workload and uh, basically it's transparent to your end users. Um, it also great, gives you a great way to do application upgrades. Say uh, you're transitioning from I don't know, Drupal 5 to Drupal 6. That's a big change. It, it changes a lot of your back-end stuff. Well, you can perform that on, uh, you know, your secondary systems, test them out, have them ready to go, and then fail over to them, and automatically you're up running on that Drupal 6 thing. Then you can take your primary systems, upgrade them, fail back to them, and everything's on, you know, the updated code base and you've, you've had no downtime. So those are basically the goals or, or the things we want to do with it. Uh, you know, eliminate the possibility of getting that call at 4 a.m. because something's crashed and uh, eliminating the possibility of having to schedule yourself to do this crap at 4 a.m. because nobody wants to be up at that time unless they're drinking. <clears throat> So, uh, and I already kind of talked about this, common pitfalls, the very first point, you know, if your UPS takes a dirt nap and your redundant power supplies are linked into that, you're dead. Uh, let's say you have uh, even two different systems. If that power line fails, you're dead. And, and you can take this very far to where you have, uh, you know, uh, a secondary HA system in another data center in another part of the country so if you have, you know, a massive blackout like they had uh, five, six years ago up in the New York area. Anybody remember when that happened? Okay, I see we have nobody who reads the news. Uh, so when something like that happens, you could fail over automatically to a second data center or, or whatnot. Um, again, things like RAID, these are only a partial solution. These are, are, are basically band-aids, whereas HA is a, a full solution or if it's well implemented, it's a full solution. <clears throat> People have RAID because hard drives fail. I mean, other than fans, you know, you've got fans, hard drives, and power supplies in your computer, and those are pretty much your only moving parts. You know, those are what wear out quickest because they're the only things that have, you know, bearings that give out and all kind of crap. Uh, so, you know, you do RAID there because you know they're going to fail. I mean, we have those because we know those are going to take a dirt nap sometime, and we want, you know, to avoid outages there. But, you know, that does you no good if you have, say, a kernel seg fault on you. Uh, in those situations, you know, no amount of hardware planning can help you out if your software just decides to go, you know, batshit crazy. Uh, a lot of people talk about load balancing. Load balancing, it, it's not high availability. It might seem like it at first. You know, let's say we got those same four web servers that we talked about before, and we are uh, load balancing, you know, requests between all four of them. Well, we can have one fail, and the other three are still strong enough to pick up its load. That's still not high availability because our load balancer is now our single point of failure. Instead of our web server being our single point of failure, our load balancer is now. So now you have to, you know, look at that new single point of failure and make it high availability. Uh, another thing, let's go back to our uh, four web servers thing. Uh, multiple redundant operating systems at or near peak load. Let's say we got those four web servers and they're operating at 80% of their total peak and one of them fails. Well, that one still has more load than the other three can pick up at the same time. So a single point of failure doesn't mean a single thing that can fail, but it means a single service that can fail. You need to, uh, you know, have enough spare to pick up the load for any one failure because we're not talking about system availability. We're talking about service availability. That's a very key distinction that needs to be made and understood. So how do we get that with Linux? Uh, 
And yes, I did more than just screw up how to spell contributor. Uh, I was halfway drunk when I made this presentation. Forgive the, uh, you know, the problems with the being there. Uh, so how do we get there with Linux? Uh, if you don't very much know about Linux networking, in Linux you can make an aliased IP address or add a second IP address to an Ethernet interface like I've done here. You can see ETH0 has 172.116.1.1 and it's in a uh, slash 28, I believe that is, subnet. I'd have to do the math and I don't care to. Uh, slash 27, sorry. Uh, but then we also have a second IP address, 172.116.3.1.3 in that same subnet. Now imagine we have two systems, one on dot one and one on dot two. If one of those services also has dot three aliased here, we can then, uh, if that server fails, the second service can spin up dot three on its internet or its ethernet card, its NIC, and uh, pick up those services almost instantaneously. There's some lag involved, but for practical purposes, it's as good as you're going to get without spending buku's of money. So uh, HA networking, and this is kind of what I just said there. Like I said, I have not practiced this speech at all. Uh, configuring these sort of type services where your service is running all the time is very easy because you only have to share an IP address. Um, think, for example, like Apache, SendMail, whatever. You can have it listen on 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, all interfaces, all IP addresses, and uh, whenever you spin up a new IP address on that box, it's automatically listening to it. Uh, some services don't work that way, or maybe you don't want to configure it that way for some reasons. You know, maybe you've got additional NICs on it, and you want it listening on some and not listening on others. There's a lot of reasons you might want that. Uh, but, you know, when you just have to share an IP address like we have in this situation where we can set up this alias IP, it's very easy to set up HA networking. Yeah. Out of, uh, it's a slash, uh, hell, I'm not even going to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I was, I was half drunk when I wrote this speech. Uh, and, and yeah, if y'all have questions, don't save them for the end. Just go ahead and, you know, don't even bother sticking them in your hand. Just shout them out. I will get to them. Uh, unless they're stupid. So we're going to look at a sim simple uh, uh, config for just sharing an IP address. Um, there's three files when you install Heartbeat, and I'm not going to cover compiling, or I figure y'all can, y'all are smart enough, y'all can figure all that stuff out on your own. Uh, but, you know, we have basically three config files, ha.cf, ha resources, and every time I see that, I want to say hair resources. It's like where Bugs Bunny gets all his crap. Uh, and authentication keys, or auth keys. Uh, HA.CF is the main sort of configuration thing. Uh, HA resources is what resources we're going to have in this high availability cluster. And I hate to use that word cluster because it means so many different things that it has no meaning. It's kind of cliche. And authentication keys. Uh, authentication keys is the very easiest one to look at. We'll look at it first even though it's third on the list. It's just basically uh, some very long sort of password you can think of it like that, uh, that each one of these systems must have. Because if they don't match, it won't trust it. It won't trust the signals it's sending or not getting from the other. Uh, HA.CF, pretty much a simple uh, thing. I'm not going to go over everything, but log facility, that's just the syslog facility to use. You can redirect it as needed. Uh, keep alive, two seconds. Uh, UDP port. You can actually do it on TCP, but I wouldn't recommend it because you're just adding, you know, additional crap you don't need. Um, UDP port 694, I figure y'all can all figure that out. Uh, there's, two other, there's two ways to do this. You can either do a broadcast or a unicast, and I've got them both here so you can kind of see them. Uh, 
but you would only want to use one or the other. Broadcast is where you basically send out to everything in your subnet. Uh, and it can make, it, it can make your, if you have a whole bunch of these, ten, you tend not to, but if you have a whole bunch of them, it can make your configuration simpler. Unicast is where you're just denoting another peer. Here we just have two, you know, haproxy01.example.com and haproxy02. And uh, so haproxy02 is on dot two, haproxy.1 will be on dot one. And uh, forgive me because I realize these IP addresses do not match. Uh, like I said, half drunk when I wrote this presentation. Uh, auto failback, this is something that can be useful or not be useful. Uh, I tend to leave it disabled by preference. Uh, basically what this says is when the primary node fails, okay, it goes offline for whatever reason, the secondary node, HAProxy02, will pick it up and will begin, you know, offering all the services and things. Well, when HAProxy01 comes back online, if you have auto fail back on, it will automatically switch back to using the primary. Make sense? The reason I don't use it is because if, if the first one fails, I don't want it coming back online, you know, mysteriously and working. You know, it may have some weird uh, uh, hardware bug and make, makes it reboot and bounce up and down. Uh, and I don't want switching back and forth, risking that. So uh, I usually keep it disabled. And uh, then once you bring HAProxy01 back on, you have to manually fail it over through something like a uh, heartbeat restart. Uh, HA resources in this situation, uh, forget the HAProxy tacked on here to the end. We're not really worried about that just yet. The first line is your primary node in the cluster. Again, I hate that word, uh, haproxy01.example.com. Uh, everything else is resources to share. And I've simplified this file a bit uh, just because I didn't want it running on forever. Uh, the first resource we're sharing is that IP address, 172.16.1.3. There's other options there where you can pass it different net masks, different gateways, different uh, NICs you want it spun up on. Uh, but overall, you know, this, is, this should be good for demonstration purposes. We're sharing this resource. When we start up Heartbeat, uh, this IP address, dot three, will get shared. And, uh, you know, we'll, it won't get shared. It will get spun up on whichever one is active at the moment. And uh, then, you know, if the other one fails or the active one fails, the other one picks it up. You know, pretty, pretty simple stuff. The next one there, HA proxy says to start the HA proxy service. And basically that does a forward slash Etsy forward slash init.d forward slash HA proxy start. If you're using Slackware and you should be, you'll have to actually add that file yourself for most things because we use a more sane init structure. Uh, this is where crap gets complicated. It's easy in this situation right here to say, well, this box has failed. Let me spin up this proxy server. This proxy server, all it's doing is, you know, proxy proxying commands between the outside world and some internal system. It doesn't need to have very much data. Uh, it doesn't need to know any of the data that the other one knows. All it has to have is a config file, and I can copy that config file between systems when I make a change. Not that big a deal. But when we need to do data sharing, stuff gets hairy. Uh, the traditional way we do it is with something called DRBD, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, because this crap is difficult. If you have very little data and you're not expecting, you know, uh, a failover that doesn't have a complete data set will be a big deal, you might be able to just R-sync stuff between them. You know, if you've got, say, a Samba share that's, you know, just a bulk share, but you want to keep it going all the time, you can probably R-sync data back and forth between it and you know, call that from cron every 10, 15 minutes, whatever you think is best, and you know, it should be okay. But if you need something that's real time, say 
someone is uploading content to your web servers, making posts on a forum, uh, things of that nature. Data sharing between your primary system and your secondary, very important, because you need that data in real time. If you're going to do that, there's really only two ways to do it that I, that I am prepared to speak on. Well, really only one I'm prepared to speak on and one I'm prepared to mention. Uh, DRBD, it's, uh, we'll get on to that in the next slide, or a clustering file system like GFS2 or, or OCFS. Uh, clustering file systems, it's a little bit like RAID. You know, we've got, we've got multiple boxes that have all this data, but that clustering file s server is still, blah. That clustering file system is probably on a SAN somewhere connected via iSCSI to multiple targets. That SAN is then a single point of failure. You know, you then have to figure out ways to do that. And I am intimately familiar with the problems that causes, and that is all that I'm going to say on that subject. <laughs> uh, well, I'll say this much. SAN failure is not fun. Uh, so what's DRBD? It's a distributed replicated block device. Now what the hell is that? A block device is essentially like a hard drive partition or a hard drive. It's something where data is stored in blocks. You know, we have, uh, we want to write out a file, we allocate this block, we write it into this spot on the block, it's, you know, written. Uh, distributed, if you don't know what distributed or replicated means, you probably should not be attending this talk. Uh, but it sits between the uh, DRBD, it sits between the file system, say EXT3 or EXT4 or whatever file system you're using, and the raw devices on two different computers. Uh, you know, the raw device will be your hard drive or your hard drive partition. Uh, and what this is does is when files are changed, added, removed from the file system, before they are actually committed to disk, uh, or as they're being committed to disk, I should say, the uh, DRBD notes which blocks on that disk are being changed, what the changes are, and it will send it to a secondary computer that's listening, you know, by Ethernet, Gigabit, whatever, and uh, that secondary system, which doesn't even have the file system mount at this point, will write that changed data in those blocks directly to the, to the uh, disk. Uh, and we'll show how this works here in a minute. This is the drbd.conf file, and this is highly simplified. They get a lot more complicated than this. If you go on the uh, internet and start Googling drbd, you'll get a lot more information than I can give you in this slide. But uh, here I've set up uh, two drbd instances. Uh, one's on HAProxy01, that's a physical computer. The other's on HAProxy02, another physical computer. And I've made partitions on both of these boxes. We'll assume that their hardware is identical. Uh, SDA2, you can see disk, dev, SDA2 on both of them will be device, dev, DRBD0 on uh, each one. And then we have the addresses of each box, dot one for HAProxy01, dot two, for HAProxy02, and uh, the port numbers that DRBD will be communicating on. And we're also storing MetaDisk information internally. Basically, that means uh, MetaDisk meta -disk information. I can't really explain everything about it because, quite frankly, I don't know. Uh, but uh, basically, you can store that information on that disk, on that partition, or you can store it somewhere else. This is just telling DRBD where to find all that information that it needs. Uh, things like, you know, which other system is there, uh, where am I at as far as replication and re replicating in case replication breaks. So once we've got that config file in place, oh, and let me, uh, let me go back and mention another thing. Where you have uh, the uh, common thing, protocol C, that's pretty much the one you're going to want all the time. That's the one where when blocks are allocated to the primary, they get allocated to the secondary at the same time. 
There's a few other ways which, you know, may or may not be useful depending on your application. But uh, this is how we actually create uh, DRBD nodes. Remember, we have our file system. Well, there's actually no file system on it at all. We have our hard drive partition, SDA2. We're going to, uh, we made that resource 01. You can see in the resource section, it's resource 01. And then DRBD admin refers to it as resource 01 forever, essentially. Um, first step is creating the metadata. That's, you know, what tells it, you know, where we synced, how we synced, this, that, and the other. Uh, you have to attach the volume, you have to set up synchronization, you have to connect to the peer. And you pretty much have to do these more or less simultaneously on the two different boxes. Uh, you don't have to, but you know, it, it'll help your understanding if you think of us, hey, I'm typing this on the first computer, hit enter, I go, I type it on the second computer, hit enter. Uh, so the first thing, you know, we're writing the metadata to wherever we stored it. In our config file, we stored it internally, metadisk, internal. Uh, the next thing to do is attach the resource. This is uh, basically uh, just still set up processes. This is where it is creating dev drbd0. It's creating this fictitious block device, drbd0 which Linux will act as if it is a real block device as far as the file system, as far as all your regular tools, CP, rsync, all that crap is concerned. DRBD0 is just another hard drive partition. Uh, then you set up synchronization. This is where it starts to sync data between uh, the two different disks or prepares to do it anyhow. And then you connect to uh, the other node. Again, notice, you know, we're talking DRBD admin to resource one in every case. We're not saying, you know, DRBD admin to SDA2 to dev DRBD0. As far as DRBD is concerned, it looks at it as a resource. And if you look back at our config file, and uh, you can line up, you know, the uh, brackets if I did that right, you'll see that resource 01 has two nodes on it, HAProxy01, HAProxy02, and then the information is in them. That's why the command is the same on both nodes. It's not DRBD admin on HAProxy01, this partition. We just refer to it as the resource. It looks up its own host name and, uh, you know, looks up the information for that host name in the uh, config file. So, now this is uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, but at this point, you should have a proc DRBD0, and I screwed that up on this presentation as well, on both nodes for information on your volumes. Uh, it should be, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't screw that up on the presentation. I screwed it up out of my mouth. Uh, at this point, in the proc file system, procfs, you should have a file called proc drbd, and I don't think I have any content from that file because sand failure sucks. Uh, but uh, anyhow, this will tell you, you know, whether I'm the primary node at this time, whether I'm the secondary, is my information up to date? Am I syncing to the other node? Is the other node syncing from me? You can read all that information just by cat proc drbd at this point. Uh, if we need to, we can also force the secondary box to uh, overwrite whatever it has on SDA2 with whatever we've got. So, you know, you could set up this box and uh, already have your data and stuff on it and then force synchronization to the other thing, almost like you've done in rsync. The difference here is because de DRBD deals with blocks, you can't just... Uh, you can't just copy, you know, let's say I have SDA2 and I want to rsync everything on that partition to this other box. When you do that rsync, those files, while they're identical, they might be in different blocks on that file system. So you have to uh, tell DRBD, you know, overwrite by block, not overwrite by file, because DRBD knows nothing about files. 
it knows only about bits and blocks. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. The one of you who didn't raise your hand, poo on you. Uh, so at this point, uh, you know, PROC DRBD will show information on how much of the volume's been synced after you've run this command and, uh, you know, how fast it's going. There's a lot of different uh, options you can use, which I don't have room to go over or time, but, uh, you know, they can speed it up, they can slow it down. You can say, we want to deal in blocks that are 40, 96 in size or, you know, 65, 536, I think that's right. Uh, you know, you can say, it's just like DD. Everyone familiar with DD? You know, you've got byte size, block count, that sort of thing. It's the same sort of situation with uh, DRBD. You can say, read this much data, send this much data at a time, and, you know, play with your speed that way. And you can achieve very good performance uh, with such tweaks. So now we want to make uh, DRBD and Heartbeat play nice. Uh, DRBD volumes, like I said, they, they'll be marked as primary or secondary. And uh, I'm good on time, man. Uh, you can only actually read from the primary. DRBD in the kernel will block you from mounting that file system if it's the secondary. It'll block you from doing all kinds of crap because it wants exclusive read and write access to it. Really, it's not even concerned about reads when it's the secondary. It's only concerned about writes. So, you know, if you have a complete failure, a complete meltdown, uh, reading, excuse me, unless you have a meltdown on that, set, on that first box or specifically fail over to the second one, you can't actually read that data on that second one. All you can do is read the block device. Uh, when we have our primary system, in, in my example, it'll be HAProxy01. When it fails, the secondary system, HAProxy02, it must take over as the primary. You have to tell it essentially, hey, take over as the primary. How do we accomplish that? Uh, heartbeat's what allows us to do it. Uh, and then when a failed system comes back online, remember we, when we were talking about auto failback being on or off? Uh, this is one of the reasons why you would want it to be off. Because say, you know, HAProxy01, it goes offline, it's off for a day. HAProxy02 picks up, everything's fine and dandy, uh, it continues to work, but we get a whole day's worth of updates to it. We don't then want 01 to come back and spin up and take over without that day's activity. That day's activity could be forever lost to us once 01 starts sending writes to the secondary. So uh, when, a, when a failed system comes back online, it has to come up as a secondary if you care at all about that data, and then sync that entire partition's data. And it's not even that entire partition's data, it's that entire partition. If it's a 200 gig partition with 50 kilobytes of data on it, it has to sync that 200 gig partition because DRBD has no idea what is actually on there. All it sees is zeros and ones in blocks. Uh, so how do we tell Heartbeat what to do? If you'll recall from our early example where we had the uh, hair resources file, and again I said it's HA resources, uh, this is where uh, DRBD disk is sort of the service, and now we have all these fancy colons and stuff. We have to tell it, you know, various options. That's how that's accomplished in the HA resources file. I don't have time to go through all of it, but basically this is saying DRBD disk resource one, and if we look back at our config file, you can see, again, we're resource one here. Uh, go ahead, spin that up. Let's, be, let's become primary now. Uh, file system, this is saying, hey, now I want to mount a file system. The file system I want to mount is dev drbd0. And I want to mount it on mount because that's the only place I could think to put a fictitious file system. And the file system type is ext3. You can actually avoid some of this by uh, putting this as an option in uh, Etsy fstab. You know, you want to be, you want to use the no auto 
mount option in F stab or FS tab, whatever. Uh, yeah, don't make fun of me. I'm the one up here speaking. Uh, but yeah, you could you could put all that information in there for the most part and just say, hey, mount forward slash MNT. But I figured I'd give you the long version because you came here to you know hear me talk. Uh, so what that says is when HA proxy does the failover, run these commands. Spin up the resource one, make it the primary, mount the file system, and that's all we're doing here. Typically, you would want to do something additional, like say, start Samba, start NFS, start you know some other network file system. But you know, for purposes of this talk, we're just worried about you know spinning up DRBD. So, uh, like I said, HA resources. That's what tells Heartbeat what services are being managed. Once again, it's sort of, you know, your most important file, more or less. Once you get the other set up, this is probably the only one you're going to be making changes in because you're going to be adding more services that you want to, uh, to change. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different options to it. Like right here on HA Resources, we could add, you know, even more lines and say, run this script, uh, run this additional service run this script with these options to it, uh, you know, with these arguments, things of that nature. So it's a very powerful thing. It's basically, think of it like expect for the network. We're sitting here, you know, waiting for something, and then when something happens, bam, we do all this. Or think of it as a while loop that's, you know, waiting for a condition to be true. And then once it's true, we exit and do all this crap. Make sense? Uh, so, you know, more on HA resources, typically, you know, shared IP addresses, shared file systems, network services, because when we want high availability systems, we tend not to care if your desktop crashes. I mean, it might inconvenience you, but it doesn't inconvenience anyone else. And having us set up, you know, two workstations for you with seamless failover and all that stuff, that's just too much work for too little gain. You know, call the help desk, get them to fix your Windows box, and, uh, you know, go on about your business. Um, many services, again, I touched on this a little bit earlier, they don't need to be started or stopped by heartbeat and can simply run all the time. Uh, again, you know, if it's listening on uh, all interfaces, you don't have to, you know, start or stop it. You can just let it run all the time. You might also want to start and stop it in case, you know, it crashes. You know, you don't want your secondary Apache server to crash a month or so ago and nobody realizes it because nobody's pointing at it. And then suddenly it picks up the IP address and bam, there's nothing listening there. Uh, but, you know, more or less when you have something like that, you can just share the IP address. But different things, and, and we'll go back to our load balancer example here, you want to spin up only when it's the active node. For example, HA proxy is a TCP and HTTP, HTTP proxy server. Uh, load balances between multiple boxes. So we have four web servers, we're load balancing between them. And uh, HA proxy, we want to make high availability because you know, we're pointing everyone at dot three, dot four, and dot five. Those are our HA proxy interfaces going to, I don't know, maybe 16 different web servers. If you go to dot three, it gets sent to, you know, these four web servers, which do your plon environment. If you go to dot four, it goes to these two, which are just, you know, uh, static web servers, you know, serving static images or whatnot. So, uh, you know, depending on something like that, you can't have it listening all the time because that interface isn't up. You know, you can say listen on everything, and then when it spins one up, it, you know, listens on it as well because it's listening on anything. But if you, want, if you want to handle things differently by what IP address it hits, then you basically have to start those systems, those services up once you uh, have a failover event. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, oh, yeah, like I said, halfway drunk while I was doing this. <laughs> that was supposed to be the questions and comments tab. Uh, 
Thankfully, I did not make it too much longer because uh, I got a little uh, gypped on my time today. But, uh, you know, what kind of questions has anybody got? Because, you know, bounce off of me. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, what he's asking about is, uh, let's say we have three servers and we need two of them to be up at all times. Uh, so we have active, active, and passive. Uh, such things are doable, they're complicated. Uh, they're not easy to do, and often that's when you have something like broadcast, you know, when you're doing uh, that kind of many different ones. Uh, lots of times because of the additional complexity, people will just have... Uh, active, active, and then two secondaries, and those two actives will point at different secondaries. Uh, so, you know, that, that doesn't help you if active and secondary fail, but neither does, you know, only having three systems. Um, the downside there is you have to have additional resources sitting there on standby. Uh, that might be doable in, in a highly virtualized environment. It might not be. Um, so... You know, it is doable, but it's complex. I think there was another question back here. Yeah. Okay, uh, his question was, uh, you know, we talked a lot about doing uh, data replication from uh, box to box via the network. Uh, what about fiber channel replication, where essentially you have one physical disk on fiber channel hooked up to two or more uh, physical systems or virtual systems. Uh, that is doable, and a lot of people do it. It's expensive as crap, though. Um, well, it's been a while since I looked at it, but again, it, it depends largely if you have a highly virtualized environment like I'm used to working with, that's you know, not necessarily an option because you don't necessarily have physical hardware on the actual boxes that need it. But yeah, that is an option. Fiber channel is a great option for something like that. Uh, the one thing you have to worry about is uh, you know, the secondary box doing some sort of ride on it at the same time. But again, and, and here's another thing. You're, when you're using fiber channel to uh, distribute the same data across you know, an active and a uh, passive system, you know, your failover. Your fiber channel device, that's potentially another single point of failure because if it fails, it doesn't matter what these two boxes are doing because they don't have access to that data. Is that, you know... Yeah. Right, that's almost like, right, that's almost uh, almost like a clustering file system, but you don't have uh, individual file or block locking. Uh, fiber channel, uh, in that situation, I'm not entirely sure. I've never done it. I know some people do. I don't have access to the actual devices. Uh, but, yeah, there's, there's a service you run that says, you know, let me run this service with this argument, and it will turn on fiber channel for me and that fiber channel device will immediately say hey this one's requested something uh, you know I'll make it the active and shut off the secondary box uh, you know there's so many other great things that I wanted to touch on and I just forgot to put into this thing like uh, stoneth does anybody have any idea what stoneth means not you <laughs> Stoneth is an acronym, and it's my very favorite acronym in the world. It means shoot the other node in the head. Uh, so it's a way of saying, hey, I'm the secondary box. I want to be the primary. Bang, you're dead. Uh, that's just beautiful. <laughs> uh, you had another question, sir? Yeah. 
Well, it's not encryption because uh, if we look at the thing here, let me go back and find the right thing. You'll see it's just a SHA-1 sum. It's not really, you know, like a full public-private encryption key thing. It's, it's not the greatest in the world, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it doesn't encrypt the data being going back and forth, but it does, you know, basically apply hash based on that uh, and, you know, uh, to legitimize it. Say so what? Exactly, exactly. It's more like a password key than a uh, encryption key. Somebody else? That's a good question. I do not know the answer to that. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. The uh, question was, was the uh, data, uh, you know, encrypted as it going across the thing? Well, with Heartbeat, it more or less doesn't matter for the most part because there's not really, really any real data going unless you're talking about DRBD uh, because it's just saying, hey, I'm alive. Hey, I'm alive. Hey, I'm alive. And then when you stop seeing those, it, you know, dies. Uh, yeah. That's a good point. What he said is uh, if you were running Lux, basically hard... Uh, hard, hard drive partition uh, encryption in Linux. You know uh, the data going back and forth would be encrypted at that point. Uh, that's a very good point. That's why he is Patrick Volkerdink and I'm Alan Hicks. <laughs> Am I out of time yet? Left. Oh, I got a couple minutes left. Wow, I get to you know go ahead. Uh, his question was, have I ever used it with open file or two open file or SANs? No, I have not. Uh, and generally, when you start talking about SAN environments, uh, most of those, I'm more familiar with Equalogic than Storage Network or, or some other things, but they tend to have their own sort of uh, replication strategies, which are separate from the uh, actual devices that run on top of them. You can set up one, uh, you can set up a system where... Uh, you know, if it goes down, it spins up on another SAN unit in case of SAN failure. But uh, I've never had to go quite that far before. Uh, usually, if you're talking about something that disastrous, uh, and trust me, I know how that disastrous it can be, uh, it, uh, you don't necessarily mind so much a little bit of downtime to go to this other thing spin up your volumes, spin up your systems or your virtual machines or whatever on the it, grab the data that way. Uh, you know, it, it, it depends on how important your uh, stuff is. If you're Bank of America, if you're running a nuclear missile silo, I want you to have something that will instantaneously transfer between SANS in case of failure. But uh, for most of us, it's not, you know, uh, it, it, it's a question of, how likely is it and how difficult and expensive it is? You know, and if you multiply those together and it doesn't reach, you know, a certain point that uh, you're all that worried about it, then, uh, you know, you ignore it and just hope to restore from backup. Somebody else, ask a question. Any question. A good question, not a stupid question. Oh, that just kind of ruled Robbie out, didn't it? Uh, come on, somebody, feed me something. A master DNS server? No, I have not, because I have multiple secondaries. Uh, what's the question mark mean? Oh, repeat the question, crap. Uh, sorry, his question was, have I ever used it to, uh, uh, protect a master DNS, uh, a master DNS server? I haven't. And, and the reason for it is that DNS has a certain amount of this already built into it by design. The protocol, you know, you have a master, you have one or more multiple uh, secondary systems. So uh, generally speaking, what you would do is you would just have your master online, you would have your slave online at the same time in sort of an active-active configuration, and, uh, you know, the net load balances between the two. Uh, there are some situations where you might want that, uh, but generally speaking, DNS has enough 
uh, replication built into it and all? Go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and his clarification is he meant it more as towards the DHCP server because the DHCP, the DHCP server has to uh, communicate with the master DNS server. You're referring to things like do, uh, do not, dynamic DNS updates for uh, a particular zone or uh, a particular in-dash adder zone. I've not done that. That's interesting. Uh, but yeah, you would you would pretty much have to do something like that in order to have uh, you know DHCP systems working properly and high availability. Because uh, now I'm down to 30 seconds. Awesome. I can finish your question and not ask another. Because uh, in that situation, and I completely lost track. Because. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in in DHCP situations, you're pretty much limited to one DNS server. I mean, one DHCP server per, per uh, subnet or per segment or VLAN or whatever you want to do it as. Because uh, you know, if you have multiple ones, they they don't tend to play nice together. Any other questions? You've got about 15 seconds. Come on, people. Ten. Everyone but Rob can leave at this point. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. OS. An OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices. HP Slate and WebOS. HP.